kinesthetic learning exercise now to identify the muscles of the gluteal region. We're going to be starting with the deeper muscles and working our way more superficially for the sake of the drawing itself, which means we're going to start with the gluteus minimus muscle. Gluteus minimus originates on the, off the outer surface of the ilium, specifically between the anterior and inferior gluteal lines. And then from there, it's actually going to attach the greater trochanter, but more along the anterior border. So this one's actually going to run um, more to the anterior aspect. As a result, even though it might be hard to really appreciate with this diagram, this is certainly going to be an abductor of the thigh, which should be pretty easy to identify. But what might be surprising based on this two-dimensional diagram is it's actually going to be a medial rotator of the thigh, even though we're drawing it along the posterior aspect. And I plan to explain this a little bit better and do a demonstration class to show how this is the case. Gluteus medius muscle now. It's more superficial to the gluteus minimus. Once again, off the external surface of the ilium, but this time between the anterior and posterior gluteal lines. So consequently, it originates more medially compared to the gluteus medius. In this case, it's going to attach to the lateral surface of the greater trochanter, as long, or also along the posterior surface. So we don't have to do a dotted line representation. This is going to go straight to the back. And again, this is gluteus medius now. And it's going to share the exact same functionality as the gluteus minimus muscle in that it's going to abduct and, once again, medially rotate the thigh. And we'll demonstrate this a little bit better when we're in class itself. That now takes us to the gluteus maximus muscle. You've probably heard of this one. Um, this is the one that makes up the superficial structure of the gluteal region, the buttocks, if you will. It comes off the outer surface of the ilium itself, as well as a large portion off of the sacrum. And in addition, it will actually come off the sacrotuberous ligament to a large extent as well. And you will notice this in lab, that it has quite this extensive origin point. It's not a very easy dissection to do, and you'll actually have to strip it away from that ligament itself. From there, the gluteus maximus is going to attach into the iliotibial band, and the gluteal tuberosity of the femur itself. So you'll see this attachment bit more inferior as well as the iliotibial band. So what's prominent with this attachment point is that it doesn't reach all the way up to the iliac crest itself. So in anatomy lab, you will actually be able to find that superior border um, in this region up here. And when you find that and go superior to that, you will be able to actually palpate the gluteus medius muscle, which is also important for certain clinical diagnostic tests that we'll be talking about as well. Function of the gluteus maximus. Uh, this is going to be the most powerful extensor of the hip itself, and pound for pound, it's the most powerful muscle within the entire body. Now, that being said, its role and extension is typically from a flexed hip position. So, for example, when you're standing up from a chair, or when you're climbing a flight of stairs, the gluteus maximus is going to be the powerful hip extensor for that. During normal walking activity or just uh, normal standing and maintenance of balance, the gluteus maximus is actually going to be uh, fairly silent and not used nearly as much as some of the other hip extensors that we'll be talking about. Next muscle for us to identify is piriformis, and I'll be doing this in the right-hand diagram. Again, I'm limited to just uh, three colors in this mode, so I'm going to be going back, back to black to be able to show this. Piriformis actually stands for pear-shaped, and that gives you an idea of what it looks like. The majority of it will not be visible in that it comes off of the internal surface of the sacrum as well as off of the sacrotuberous ligament from the internal aspect. From there, however, we will see the fibers very quickly converge as they exit the greater sciatic foramen and will attach along the upper border of the greater trochanter of the femur. So you can do a straight shot along like this. So this is the only part that's actually going to be visible to you in dissection, 
at this stage of the game. The more distal aspect where we would compare this to the upper portion of a pear. Remember we were talking about that pear shape and that the lower aspect of the pear is all hidden uh, deep within the pelvic cavity. And then we have this upper portion which projects out from the greater sciatic foramen to attach to the greater trochanter. Next we have a set of three muscles that are talked about pretty much interchangeably together. Uh, first, in the middle we have obturator internus. So we talked about the obturator externus previously. The internus comes off of the internal aspect of the obturator foramen. And then, once again, very difficult to de depict with a 3D representation, but the fibers are all going to project straight out posteriorly so if they were coming out of the page at you and are going to take a 90 degree turn at this point in time to attach once again to the greater trochanter, this time along the medial surface proximal to this indentation known as the trochanteric fossa. So in this diagram they're going to come up a little bit. Now here's the unusual thing is that above and below the obturator internus, and I should also point out that that solid blue structure you're seeing, when you see it in the lab, that's just going to be the tendon. So what we just really drawn in is the tendon itself, which will have a whitest appearance. But above and below this obturator internus tendon, we have a pair of muscles, which will actually come off and will fuse into the obturator internus tendon. And so these are known as our superior and inferior gemellies. The superior, as we see, comes off of the outer surface of the ischial spine, and the inferior is going to come off the upper surface of the ischial tuberosity, and then they fuse into that obturator internus tendon. So gemellus is a term meaning twin, if you think of Gemini. And so we think of these as twin muscles that help to assist the obturator internus with its pull. Final muscle to talk about is the quadratus femoris muscle. So this is going to come off of the lateral border of the ischial tuberosity. As the name implies, it's going to be a square-shaped muscle, which is going to attach to the posterior aspect of the femur in a spot appropriately named the quadrate tubercle. And it's noticeable because of its square appearance relative to some of the other muscles that you've been identifying. And that is your quadratus femoris muscle. Start looking at the posterior compartment of the thigh with a kinesthetic learning exercise. So I'll be focusing on the muscles and discussing the innervation of these muscles in a moment. But the vascular supply was already discussed, so there's really not too, too much to it. Four muscles total in this region, three of which share a common origin, a common function, and have a common innervation. So they're collectively known as the hamstring muscle group. You've probably heard that term when pulling hamstrings and such. Gets that name from the fact that in butcher shops they would typically take a pig and open up the back of the leg and use this muscle group, the tendon of this muscle group, to hang the pig up for smoking purposes and such. So consequently, the name hamstrings. The three muscles all have a common origin off of the ischial tuberosity in this region here, and so we're pretty much going to draw them all together. All three of these muscles will actually cross both the hip and the knee joints themselves. The first that we'll be looking at will attach on the medial aspect. first one is known as semimembranosus muscle. Its insertion point is along the posterior surface of the tibia, and as we'll note when we look at the knee itself, these fibers will also actually run partially into the posterior joint capsule of the knee. It tends to have a very, very thick tendinous attachment, hence the name semimembranosus. Second muscle will originate off the same spot, but in this case, it will lie on top of semimembranosus the majority of the way, but as we get towards the terminal portion, the fibers become very thin, and then will actually project out towards the anterior aspect of the tibia. 
And so if you remember, when talking about the anterior compartment of the leg, we talked about this structure known as the pes anserinus. This is the third muscle that attaches into the pes anserinus. And this is your semitendinosus muscle. So again, its tendon tends to be a lot thinner. So proximally, it almost completely masks semimembranosus. But as you get more distally, you can see the semimembranosus on either side. And these are the two tendons that you can actually feel in a sitting position. If you pull back and flex your knee and get these muscles to stand out, you can feel a very thick semimembranosus on the medial aspect and then a very thin tendon, the semitendinosus, uh, just superficial to that. On the lateral side, we have the long head of the biceps femoris. So this muscle, once again, has a common origin point, but unlike the other two, it's actually going to attach to the lateral surface on the head of the fibula primarily. And so consequently, this one crosses to the lateral aspect of the leg. Now when we think of the term a bicep, we usually think about two heads. And this actually does have a second head known as the short head of biceps femoris, but what you'll notice is it originates off of the posterior aspect of the femur along this margin here. So consequently it does not cross the hip it will have no function on the hip, and it actually has a slightly different innervation pattern as we'll look at. But again, it has the same attachment point because it blends in perfectly with the long head of the biceps femoris. And so the two of them are two fused muscles at this point in time. But earlier on, it has a very distinct origin point and actually does have a distinct innervation. So consequently, the first three muscles that can be grouped together as the hamstrings will all be responsible for extension of the hip and flexion of the knee, whereas the biceps.